That's what I thought. That's all right. That was the perfect time to do it. Okay, so um, we're talking banking. We're talking money, which is kind of a fun topic here that we all have our hands on. And what is considered money? Let's kind of do a short little review from yesterday that you can look back in your notes. What is money? What is money? Anything that is generally accepted as a need of pain. Okay. So basically anything that people generally accept as a means of payment. So it's not defined as, um, you know, for sure greenbacks or, you know, that it has to be dollar bills, that, that's part of it. But you kind of always ask yourself, can I take this and go to the store and people are going to generally accept it as payment? Answer, yes, right? And same thing with your uh, debit card, which is connected to your checking account. So the actual checking account was the other thing that we learned yesterday was the means of payment and we have different delivery devices like a check or a debit card or whatever uh, to access that those accounts. That is what money is. All right, and then we started to learn that the supply of money in the United States is controlled by the Federal Reserve Bank in the United States. So our central bank, um, so if you go to Europe, uh, and the, most of the countries over there are members of, of the European Union, and so they use the euro. How many of you have heard of euros, right? So the euro is their currency, and there is the European Central Bank. So that's a, kind of a, a little bit more complicated because there's multiple countries. Um, but it's not so different than what we did in the United States, essentially, um, as we developed the Federal Reserve System in 1913. So remember, we had individual states, and uh, prior to the Declaration of Independence, people were pretty like, oh, we don't wanna become Europe. We don't wanna be England. We're, we were controlled by England, and we, we had the Boston Tea Party, and we kinda told England to screw off and declared our independence. And the idea of the United States was to have individual acting governments, right? The idea of federalism is that uh, states will kinda run themselves, and so, they were a little leery of having a single currency for all of the states. And that's part of the reason that a national bank uh, didn't ever really develop. Um, and it wasn't until 1913 that we came up with the system that we do. And so the system that we do, that this is all kind of review for, in a different way from yesterday. I didn't show you this picture, but this is the map of the 12 Federal Reserve Banks and their location. So. A lot of them are concentrated here. Remember in 1913, did Hollywood look like it does today? In 1913, did Hollywood look good? No, California was pretty rural, right, in 1913. In fact, the whole West was pretty rural. And so they really, in terms of population base, there wasn't a lot of people living west of the Mississippi River. Um, the, the population centers here, we had Dallas and Kansas City and St. Louis. So those kind of took up a lot of handling the West. As the Federal Reserve developed, they've opened up branches. So the San Francisco uh, Federal Reserve Bank has multiple branches that cover other areas. The whole idea of the central banking system was that, again, people were leery of centralized power and they wanted them each to have an area that they had their own bank. And that way, the Kansas City Fed could talk to the Kansas City farmer and say, hey, what's happening with wheat? You know, what's happening with cattle prices? How is that impacting you? Rather than having to call up somebody they don't know in Washington, D.C. to try to uh, plead their case about the local conditions. And so it's a very decentralized uh, uh, system intentionally so that we could gather information from around the globe, around, around the states rather, not the globe, um, and bring it back to Washington, D.C., where we do have the second most powerful position in Washington was the chair of the Federal Reserve, and then we had the seven-member board of governors that we highlighted yesterday. And so ultimately, those folks gather information from the presidents of these banks 
and then ultimately implement monetary policy, which is where we left off with yesterday, trying to describe what monetary policy is. Okay, so if you get a chance to, do, to visit a Federal Reserve Bank, I encourage you to do so, it's pretty cool. Um, there's lots of money, uh, they kind of talk about the history of money and they got old coins and each one, I've been to the Minneapolis, Chicago, Kansas City, and St. Louis Fed. I can't remember if I went to Atlanta, I don't think so, but I might have. But uh, they're kind of fun to visit, even if you're just, you know, you can bring your mom and dad and it's kind of cool to see what they do there with the nation's money supply. All right, questions or comments on that quick little review? Okay, so now let's dig a little deeper into the money. And what they do with it. How does the money supply grow? So we're going to do kind of a fun thought experiment here. Suppose you find $10,000 buried in a shoebox in your backyard. So suppose you find $10,000 buried in a shoebox in your backyard. Don't know where it came from. You were just trying to build a, you had a little project going, so you're doing a little digging, all of a sudden clank, 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 and there's a little box, and then like, what is this? You open it up and there's 10,000 bucks cash, 10,000 bucks currency in your backyard in the shoebox. What do you do? Don't tell nobody. Uh, don't we go to the authorities and tell them, hey, somebody lost their 10,000 bucks? I mean, I would invest it for them, and then when they find it, <laughs> I would invest it, and then when they find it, like, hey, look, here's your cut, here's my cut. Just keep going. Right. That sounds like a biblical verse there of uh, burying the treasure in the backyard. So, yeah, okay, well, maybe. Well, let's just pretend that you do go to the authorities and they wait the legal required 30 days and luckily the owner never shows up and so now the 10,000 is back in your hands, right? So you got 10,000 bucks. All right, so let's see. Um, Corey, what are you gonna do with your 10,000 bucks? Where do you bank at? What's your bank? Capital Federal. All right, so we're gonna track Corey's Capital Federal. So Corey uh, puts the money into Capital Federal. So we've got $10,000 that gets put into a checking account. And it's gonna start off as Corey's checking account, right? And it's at Capital Federal. So this is our Capital Federal deposit account. And now Capital Federal can make some loans, right? So that's part of what we were talking about yesterday. How do banks make money? They loan it out at interest rates that are higher than what they're paying Corey on the deposits, right? So that, that's part of the function of the bank is to match borrowers and uh, savers together uh, in, the, in this market. All right, so by law, they have to hold some back. So let's assume that the required reserve, you guys have it in your notes from yesterday, the required reserve uh, ratio, little r is, let's say 20%, so 0.2. So required reserves are the amount that by law, the bank cannot loan out, right? So they can't loan out that. So the required reserves with Corey's deposit how much is required to not be loaned out? Keeping the math easy here, 20%. How much is required to not be loaned out? 2,000, good. Which means we have excess reserves of $8,000. Okay, so, <laughs> Emily, if I gave you $8,000, what would you go buy? 
Huh? No, I don't want, yeah, I'm forcing you to buy something. So have fun, whatever you want to buy, anything in the world, 8,000 bucks. This is all just a thought experiment, so we're just having fun. A phone? Well, you buy a lot of phones for 8,000 bucks. So dream a little bigger. You got 8,000 bucks. A used car, okay. So Emily's gonna buy a car. Uh, where are you gonna buy your used car from? What, what's the name of the dealership? Salina used, used Cars, all right. So here's what happened. So Emily goes into Capital Federal, which was Corey's bank, and says, hey, I'd like to get a loan for $8,000. And so she gets a loan for $8,000, goes to Salina Used Cars, buys the car. Right? So she had $8,000 in her hand from Capital Federal, ran to Salina used cars, and bought a used car. And then Salina Federal deposited it in their bank, Wells Fargo. Right? So Wells Fargo now has Salina used cars, $8,000 that they got from the sale of the car to Emily, sitting in their checking account. Right? So now, what happened is this excess reserves, once it got loaned out, it eventually ended up in another checking account. So let's keep track of some of this now. So money creation. Step number one, Corey finds 10,000 bucks cash and deposits at Capital Federal. Capital Federal loans $8,000 to Emily, who buys a car at Salina used cars. Salina deposits the $8,000 into its account at Wells Fargo. So there's our story up to this time. This will be potentially on your final exam, so I'd be writing it down in your notes if you're not. So, Salina deposits $8,000 into its account. What can Wells Fargo do now? They can loan out a fraction. How much are they required to hold back? 20% how much total? We're talking Wells Fargo now, they got 8,000. 20% of 8,000, who's got their thinking cap on? I know it's a lot of numbers. 10% of 8,000 is? 800. 800 times two is? 1,600. Which means now they can loan out the excess of 6,400. Okay, Andrew. $6,400 drops out of the sky, what are you buying? And all I ask is that it's not another used car. Uh, no, probably like an apartment. Apartment, okay, I can live with that. So we're gonna buy, basically, when you say apartment, you rent an apartment or whatever, get a nicer one, upgrade, whatever. Okay, I, I'm cool with that. Okay, so, um, so number four here, is uh, Andrew goes to Wells Fargo for a $6,400 loan for an apartment. What's the name of your new apartment complex? New home, what? New Horizon? Yeah. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but New Horizon's got a nice ring yeah. to it, but okay, New Horizon. All right, apartment at New Horizon. New Horizons. 
and H. All right, so then New Horizons deposits $6,400 into uh, Bank Midwest. So ultimately, the 6400 gets into Andrew's hands and becomes a checking account deposit at Bank of the Midwest for New Horizon. New Horizon has now opened an account, or opened, added to their account, if that's where they're banking, for $6,400. All right, well then this again leads to another multiplication here. We've got 20%, what we've got 640, 1280. 1280 has to be held back. And then the amount can be loaned out and loaned out and loaned out an infinite number of times. We can kind of keep going down until it becomes ridiculous probably, right? Where we're just loaning out a penny or something. Now remember where our story started off is that we started off with cash, and the only thing that was done was that the cash was converted into a checking account deposit. So what was M1 from yesterday? The measure of money called M1. What's included in M1? Currency, good. And it's currency in circulation. Now, was the 10,000 in circulation when it was in a shoebox? In one respect it wasn't, but how about in terms of the government's eyes? Is it out in circulation? Yeah. They don't know whether it's buried in the backyard or whether it's actively in somebody's purse or wallet, right? They have no clue. All they're keeping track of is how much is in the bank, in the bank's vault cash and the cash that they have in the cash drawers when you guys go to the, to the bank. That's all they're keeping track of. So if it's not in the bank, it's out in circulation. So this money was out in circulation and was part of M1. And then what's the other part of M1? Checking, checking account deposits. So sometimes we call them checkable deposits, on-demand deposits was another word we did, but it's basically just checking account balances. All right, so back to our thought experiment here. Does Corey always have access to his 10,000 if he wanted it? Does Corey always have access to the 10,000? Yeah, he did, it's his money, right? He took the 10,000 and he put it into a, his account at Capital Federal. Does Salina used cars always have access to their $8,000? Yeah, it's their money. They just put it in their checking account, right? They can go right against it or whatever. And then finally, does uh, what was our, our, our apartment, New Horizons, do they always have access to their 6400 Yeah. So what have we really done? We've created money in the system through the ability of banks to loan out some of the money they have on deposit. Because check it out, now we went from having 10000 to 10,000 plus 8,000 plus 6,400 plus, 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 right? It's actually a pretty big number if we filled out this whole sheet that there's a multiplier. So money that's held in checking account deposits gets multiplied through the system. So what we did was we transferred 10,000 from here so we can kind of put minus 10,000 plus 10,000. So that particular move was a push on the money supply, right? So Corey's move to take it out of cash and put it in a checking account did not increase the money supply at all, right? That was just a push. But the money supply grew then 
by 8,000 plus 6,400, dot, 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 all the way down. And so this is the multiplier process called the deposit multiplier. So key result is that um, having banks be able to loan out a fraction of deposits, of total deposits, creates money, creates money for the economy. So the way our system is designed creates money all on its own through the loaning process. Okay, let me pause there. Questions or comments so far? All right, so we have a shortcut to calculating the amount. I love shortcuts, so shortcut to calculating the total change to the money supply. Do you guys have a question? No, you, you can stand up and yeah, help yourself. Sorry, I got that podium in the way. Sometimes I try, I'll try not to write there again, but you guys always feel free to, if Jay's weighing back and needs to come up and walk halfway in the class, that's fine, do it. All right, so shortcut to calculating the money supply. So the change in the money supply, the final change in the money supply is equal to one over the required reserve ratio times the initial change in excess reserves. So the triangle is change. MS is the money supply, the total change of money. That's what M1 is trying to measure here is. We know that that first maneuver did nothing, but it grew a whole bunch through this multiplication process. And that final change then is shown by this little shortcut formula, which is one over 0.2, let's just put 0.20, but 0.2, which was the required reserve ratio of 20%, how much they could not lend out, times the initial change in excess reserves that Corey generated. So Corey generated a change of 8,000, right? That did not exist before. So that was the initial change to the excess reserves was what from Corey's maneuver. So that was our $8,000. One divided by 0.2, which is 2 tenths, which is 10 divided by two is five. So the multiplier is five times 8,000. If you added up all those numbers, it's 40,000 bucks. So the change in the money supply from this process of what we described with the used car dealer having their money, New Horizons, and all the way down, if you added up all these numbers, you get to $40,000. So this is the shortcut way to calculating that. So this is known as the deposit multiplier. So basically the five, and here's the formula, that is the deposit multiplier. Okay, questions or comments on that? All right, so the deposit multiplier shows the maximum amount 
that the money supply can change by. So note, the deposit multiplier shows the maximum amount the money supply I'll write it out this time money supply that's my MS which would be like M1 or M2 but in general we'll just say the, the supply of money the deposit multiplier shows the maximum amount the money supply can change by What would cause it to be less than 40,000? What part of my story here could cause the multiplier to be less? And it would be less, by the way. That's why this is like just showing the ultimate max. What part of my story between Corey and Andrew doing their thing? Samat? Uh, yes, that would, that would alter it here, uh, but we're, uh, we're not gonna change that one. So what part of the process, assuming that's fixed, but you're absolutely right, and I'll, we'll, we'll kind of show that later, if, if they raise the requirement to, uh, uh, let's just double it to 40, just to keep the numbers easy, then this would become 4,000, and they'd only loan out another four, right? So that would definitely bring it down, you're absolutely right. The first, uh, okay, uh, what, would, what would be, what would be going on in real life there for Corey? You're, you're on to something. What did Corey do? You're right. He, he, if he changed the initial amount, what is he doing? He still owns the 10000 right? What might Corey want to do with part of the 10000 Save it or spend it or keep it as cash, right? So Corey might choose to say, ah, I kind of like walking around with 500 extra dollars. I'm gonna keep five $100 bills and only put in 9,500 into the checking account. I'm gonna stick a thousand into my underwear drawer for as an emergency fund, which is what we teach in personal finance class, right? So I'm gonna build up my emergency fund. I'm gonna keep a thousand of it. So anywhere along here, whether it's the Salina used cars or the New Horizons apartments, if they don't deposit everything, then we don't get the maximum effect. All right, so let's put it on here. This will be probably a test question that you'll see. Why would we not get the max change in the money supply? Number one, um, people choose to hold currency instead of depositing it all. In this case, our 10,000. But it also could be any of these guys holding cash. So in general, it's just holding cash. All right, that's one area you've uncovered. What's another way that we wouldn't get the maximum effect. Maybe you can put on your banker hat now. Think of yourself being the CEO of Wells Fargo or Capital Federal or Bank Midwest. What could they do that would cause us to not get up to 40? Emily, you want to take a stab? The interest rates are going to be determined on how risky these people are with the borrowing. Think about going from this step to this step, this step to this step. What, what happened there? What did Capital Federal do? What did Wells Fargo do? They don't give you a loan or they choose to not loan out the whole amount. 
So basically, if Wells Fargo, the law says I have to hold back 20%, is it legal to hold back 25%? Can they choose to do that? Yeah. Can they choose to hold back 80%? Yeah. Maybe they think the economy's going down or something, and they're like, oh, I don't want to loan out any money. We've been loaning out way too much money. Let's just hold back. So if they hold back and instead of loaning 8,000, they only loan six of it, then, then there's a six year, right? And then the six trickles down and maybe instead of a, uh, the maximum amount being here, somebody else holds back some cash. So they can choose to not do the maximum that's allowed uh, by law. So number two is the bank chooses to not loan out all excess reserves. I'll write it out this time. All excess reserves. So they choose to not loan out everything to the maximum that they could by law. And so this is sometimes referred to as a currency drain. Referred to as a currency drain. Whether it's Corey or whether it's Wells Fargo, People who hold cash take away from the money creation effect. Okay, questions or comments on that? All right, so now we kind of see how the Fed one of the tools that they have that Samad brought up here is that they could change this. If the Fed wanted to try to increase the money supply, would they increase or decrease this number from 0.2? Would they make it 0.3 or would they make it 0.1 if the Fed wanted to have more money out in the system? 0.1, right? Yeah, so they decrease it. So now if the Federal Reserve changes their monetary policy to decrease this to 0.1, now this becomes 1,000, this becomes 9,000, and then it sets off the whole thing in the, in the chain, right? And so now we get a bigger multiplier uh, that would be end up going here. And by the way, it's a pretty big effect. If we go to 0.1, our multiplier now becomes 10 instead of five, and this number becomes nine instead of eight. So nine times 10 is 90,000. So it, the, that multiplying effect could have uh, some big results even by just cutting the required reserve ratio in half it more than doubled the money supply Okay questions or comments there So we'll start with that one. So what we're going to do is we're going to kind of highlight What would be called? expansionary Monetary policy What was expansionary fiscal policy from last week? And maybe the week before for that matter. Expansionary fiscal policy. Give me an example of what that government policy would be. Expansionary fiscal policy. Give me one example. Come on, so you got this. Look back in your notes if you're struggling. If you don't have something come to your mind right now, learn how to use those notes. Go look back. It's in there. Expansionary fiscal policy. Give me one little example. Uh, Increasing government spending. Good. What else? Give me another one now. So the government chooses a COVID policy to send everybody a check for $1,500. That's an example of expansionary fiscal policy policy. Decrease in taxes. So President Biden and Congress control the fiscal side of the house. How much money is the government spending? How much taxes are they collecting? And if they don't collect enough taxes to pay for their spending, they have to borrow. 
And that's where we get into writing government bonds, right? They come up short and then they go borrow from people all over the globe for that matter. They enter the financial markets and they borrow for that. Today with chapter 13, we're talking about monetary policy, things involving money. So expansionary, expansionary monetary policy. Expansionary monetary policy is intended to stimulate real GDP. So let's put that down for starters. Intended to expand or stimulate real GDP and or what goes along with that with unemployment? If we get back to our three biggies, maybe we should have reviewed the three biggies first. What are the three biggies that we hope monetary policy people and fiscal policy people are thinking about? What are the three biggies? Real GDP going up. Good, so increasing real GDP. Number two? Low and stable inflation, so that prices aren't going crazy like they are now. And then unemployment is low or at its natural rate, right? We expect there a healthy economy has some unemployment. <laughs> and so why would the government, why would the Federal Reserve be doing expansionary monetary policy? They're probably trying to increase real GDP and or lower unemployment. Now I'll leave it with it down here. Lower unemployment. Intended to expand or stimulate real GDP and or unemployment through increasing the money supply. So that luckily, the expansion part goes both ways. Increase money and hopefully do these things. Increase real GDP and, and decrease unemployment. I might as well add a little cautionary tale in here because this sounds too good to be true. Well, heck, why doesn't the Federal Reserve just keep cranking out money? Add money, 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 let it fly, let it rain, right? Money, 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 money. What's the catch? Eventually, what does that cause? Inflation. So the video we did yesterday on Zimbabwe, right? So we have inflation going crazy, so prices don't mean much anymore if we do it too much. So I think this is a good spot to put in the catch here is that expansionary monetary policy will ultimately be inflationary. So let's put warning, like big government warning label here that I wish they would listen to a little bit more. Warning, this will eventually cause inflation to not be low and stable. So there's a trade-off that they need to be cautious of that frankly they weren't very cautious of. The whole COVID mess and the way policy was handled uh, does come back to them you know, kind of falling asleep a little bit with principles of economics. Um, it's not uncommon for uh, people in government to get a little too big for their britches sometimes. And they, they, they think they've got an economic model that they think uh, is going to work. Uh, when, when inflation started to come out, most of the professional economists within the Federal Reserve were like, oh, this is just transitory. Uh, once we get this economy going and blah, 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 blah. And they were basically saying, no, the stuff that we're doing up here is just going to be a temporary thing, but the economy's going to get going. Everything's going to be okay. Trust us. Um, and now we got 8% inflation. So we'll see how that corrects itself over the future. Because now the Fed is doing restrictive monetary policy. So this last meeting of the Fed, the Fed uh, meets uh, regularly 
and provides a report to the nation and they basically say what the upcoming policy, they don't, they're not very transparent. They don't tell you exactly what they're going to do, but they'll say like something, well, we think the economy is getting a, a little bit overheated and we're a little concerned about inflation. So next month we might raise interest rates, you know, a half a percent or something or a quarter percent. And so they're kind of, they're, they're fairly slow moving, which by the way is good um, in general, but sometimes they don't move fast enough because there's not the political willpower uh, to do it. Even though they're supposed to be non-political, um, they, uh, they enjoy some of the um, power that they have with uh, controlling the supply of money. It is a very powerful position. Okay, so contract restrictive monetary policy. Let me go ahead and write that one out here. The other way to do it is restrictive monetary policy. So restrictive monetary policy is intended to um, oh, keep inflation low and stable to go back to our policy objectives. Obviously we're doing kind of the opposite of this, but if the economy is heating up too much, this might be a good, good spot to add in our business cycle to kind of bring things together. So the business cycle measured real GDP on the vertical axis. And over time, what's happening to real GDP? It's our roller coaster ride. So the economy has its ups and downs. And the potential for the economy is our full employment level of real GDP is somewhere in the mix. And so if the economy is currently at point A, and at this point in time, dot, 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 that means that the actual level of real GDP seems to be a lot higher than the full employment level. Maybe it's time to slow it down, right? So one policy is for the Fed to do restrictive monetary policy to kind of bring down real GDP because it's already higher than what's maybe they think is sustainable in the long run, right? Like things are heating up too much. Uh, unemployment is maybe below the natural rate or whatever. So right now in the United States, to give you kind of a update of today's world, um, unemployment's still low, inflation's high, right? Real GDP, Again, we don't always get that data, but it seems to be doing okay. Unemployment and, and GDP seem to go together. So it definitely is a time for the Federal Reserve to pursue restrictive monetary policy. My opinion is they're not moving fast enough. They should have done this three months ago. Uh, and then the moves that they are making are kind of weak. They keep thinking, or they keep uh, saying that maybe we'll do it a little faster, but I think they should do it a lot harder than what they're doing. This is the type of uh, debates that economists have. They think this way, I think this way. There's no real way to for sure dissect the answer. There's a lot of uncertainty when we're trying to think about the decentralized behavior of you guys, right? It's hard enough for me to get you to do your homework so that you do well on the test, let alone the rest of your life with getting a job and going to work and taking care of your children and whatever else goes on, right? So it's pretty difficult. There's a lot of uncertainty is my point when you're in Washington DC trying to make these moves, which is part of the logic of what we started off with today, the idea of federalism, that let's let those decisions be done more at the local levels, at the state level, or maybe even at the city and county level. Let's push down the policy action to that level. Unfortunately, as you're going to learn at the tail end of this chapter, uh, I really kind of had an aha moment this morning as I was preparing for you guys today that uh, we have not, we've done some bad stuff here that I don't think is going to have a real good ending. So that's where I plan on bringing us to. We're not, we're not quite there, but uh, I'll, that, that's, my, that's my little baiting you to stay alive and I will, I will give you my aha moment here uh, towards the end. Okay, 
Questions on expansionary versus restrictive. Sometimes I'll say contractionary because that's the other way that we do it, but your textbook uses restrictive. Okay, so now let's go through those policy tools that I did yesterday. So remember the four tools, but now we're gonna put a little more meat on the bones. Uh, let me go ahead in the order that we get, went through them yesterday. Can somebody give me what number one was? I think I, I don't know if I followed my notes or not. So we had the four tools. Just what was the first tool? It was either required, so required reserve, ratio. required reserves. Okay, so we'll start with that, which is perfect because that's what we did. Um, what Samad was bringing up, that the four tools. So if we increase, uh, let me write it out first too. Required reserve ratio. So the four tools. This time I'm going to be a little bit, a little bit more shorthand. Required reserve ratio is the little r that we just did. So an increase in the required reserve ratio leads to a decrease in the money supply. Right, so if we went from 20% to 30%, that whole multiplying process went down, right? So that is a decrease in the money supply is a restrictive monetary policy restrictive. The Fed is looking to do a restrictive policy and then of course vice versa is true. I'm gonna, I'll do it for this one, I might not write it out for each one. But decreasing the rate from 20% to 10% is of course just the opposite and that's going to lead to an increase in the money supply which is expansionary monetary policy. Questions on that one at all? Let's get caught up. Number two. What was number two on our list yesterday? It was one of the interests, right? Or sets the discount rate. Sets the discount rate. Okay, so the discount rate. So I defined it for you yesterday. Uh, let's just put a little D here for discount rate. Um, the discount rate was the interest rate that the Fed charged banks for loans. So if they were getting into trouble or something, they, remember they were the Fed is the banker's bank. They keep bank, uh, uh, money on reserve there and they can get loans. And so if the Fed changes that rate, if they increase the discount rate, they're basically raising interest rates. What does that sound like? Is that restrictive or expansionary if they're raising interest rates? Restrictive, restrictive right? They're kind of holding back, raising rates, and that's actually what's going on today uh, in today's world in Fed policy is they're looking to increase interest rates. So an increase in the discount rate is a decrease in the money supply. And if they lower the discount rate, that, of course, would be the opposite, expansionary. All right, number three. Is that the interest on reserves? What do we do? I think we saved open market operations for last Yeah, interest, it's interest on reserves. Oh, okay. Interest so this is the one that's kind of the new one. So the interest rate on reserves. Interest rate on reserves, which we'll do a little, how about IR, the interest rate on reserves. Let me do a little explanation again. So reserves are the money that they have on file with the Federal Reserve. So the reserves is the amount of money that they're not loaning out, right, that they have on deposit. So these are reserves, are deposits with the Fed. This is our banker's bank concept. You keep some of your money on deposit with me, and then if you get in trouble, I'll help you out. 
So reserves are, and let me put bank deposits. So Wells Fargo has an account at the Fed where they're holding some money. And this interest on reserves is the interest rate that the Fed is paying the banks for having their money on deposit with the Fed. Any questions on that one? It's a little bit weird, but here's a, a little, I don't know if it's a not so little known secret or not, but I think the general public would be upset. This is a new policy I told you about. It started back after the financial crisis, but even I didn't really fully understand it. I did a little research on it before, but do you think your mom and dad would be mad if they're earning 1% at the bank on their money on deposit and the bank is earning 1.5 from the government. Do you think your mom or dad would be mad about that? So they have their hard earned money at the bank earning 1% and the government is paying the bank on their money 1.5%. Do you think they'd be mad? I don't think anybody knows that, that they're getting interest on the deposits. Maybe they wouldn't care. People don't tend to care about things that I care about sometimes, but I think people would be mad. I think we could start a revolution possibly. Uh, maybe not, maybe this is all just uh, table talk, but this is something new that didn't go on in the past at all. They didn't get those interest rate on reserves. And so I suspect if mom and dad actually knew what was going on, that the government was using their money or paying them money for money that they had on there. The government's run with my tax dollars. So not only do I have, you're making money off my money, Mr. Banker, uh, but then my tax dollars are going to pay the money that you're making on my money through the government, through force. I don't, that kind of just doesn't smell right. So I'm, I'm gonna keep working on that one, but that conceptually, I might be wrong on some things. I've been wrong before, but uh, I, I think this one's a little bit there's something there that I'd like to investigate a little bit more. All right, but nonetheless, what happens with this interest rate on reserves? So if there's an increase in the interest rate that the Federal Reserve is paying the bankers, what's gonna to happen to the money supply? Is that expansionary or restrictive? So again, the bank now can make more money from the government by keeping more money on file with the government. And so is that going to be restrictive or expansionary? If the bank has more incentive to keep more with the Fed, restrictive or expansionary? Think back to our our Corey, let's just, I kind of keep coming back to Corey thinking, he's got his 10,000, the required reserve ratio was 0.2, the bank could loan out 8,000, but now the Fed has uh, offered a little more incentive. Is that gonna lead to more money or less? Are they gonna make more loans or less loans to Emily and Andrew. So they're getting more money from the government than they were before. Does that mean they're gonna loan more out to Andrew and Emily or less? Less, right? They've got more incentive to keep it uh, on file with the Fed. So this is going to be restrictive. Which is nice, it goes the same direction as this one, right? So increasing interest rates is a restrictive policy. You can just kind of remember that, where, wherever that's coming. And then a decrease in the interest rate on reserves would be expansionary. All right, well neither one of those is used very often. Tool number four is the one that's used daily, and that was our open market operations. So that was the purchase and sale of bonds 
Usually, historically, it's been government bonds, but now they've dabbled into some other types of bonds. But open market operations, buying and selling bonds on the, on the open market. And so that can go both ways. So they can do an open market purchase. An open market purchase, would that tend to increase or decrease the money supply? So for this one, I think you guys should follow this visual. So pretend that I am Jerome Powell, who is the current chair of the Federal Reserve. So just remember, chair of the Federal Reserve, that's me. And I'm going to do a purchase of one of these that Joe Biden wrote three years ago. It's been out in the economy circulating. So kind of help with the visual. Ben, sell it to Evan. That's Andrew. Go to Evan first. Evan, sell it to Robert. Robert, sell it to Samad. My point with this passing around is that that's a trade that's going on all the time, right? In the economy, Robert needed to raise some money, so he... Uh, bought it, sold it to Samad, and vice versa. That, that sucker's just circulating out in the real world, right? And now I, the Federal Reserve, the government entity, I'm gonna go do an open market purchase. What happened to the money supply? It went up. So an open market purchase leads to an increase in the money supply. It is an expansionary monetary policy. All right, well obviously a sale goes just the opposite direction. An open market sale of bonds leads to a decrease in the money supply. And again, if you have the visual, the Federal Reserve is now holding on to the bond. And by the way, Joe Biden has to pay the Federal Reserve the money that's owed on this. So it goes from one arm of the government to another arm of the government if, if, it, if there's a payment that's due for the bond. But otherwise, if Jerome Powell goes to the open market and sells it, it could be China buying it, it could be Andrew, it could be some other foreign government, but the main thing is Jerome Powell just took money out of the system. It's no longer in circulation, right? Now the bond is back in circulation rather than money being in circulation. And so that is a restrictive monetary policy. Okay, so I wanna uh, add the uh, independence of the Fed right here. So I just brought up an important point of uh, Jerome Powell and President Biden uh, with this whole thing. So let's put a little note here. The Fed is independent of the President and Congress. What does that mean? Here's what it means. Joe Biden picks up the phone, calls Jerome Powell on a video conference, it's on Zoom. Joe Biden calls up Jerome Powell and says, Jerome, give me some expansionary policy. I have the election coming up. I need the unemployment to be good. Just bump up the money supply. Jerome Powell can do this. He can even swear at him if he wants and he won't get fired. He does not work for Joe Biden or Congress. All of the decision making is completely independent of each other. And that's why we don't turn into Zimbabwe. What happened yesterday with Zimbabwe when Joe Biden was running out of cash? Inflation went crazy, so we just run the printing press. So if Joe Biden was Jerome's boss, Biden picks up the phone, Jerome, we need to pump up some cash, do some expansionary policy. And Jerome says, okay, boss, there you go. Go buy some weapons of mass destruction, right? And then we turn into possible Zimbabwe situation or Venezuela. By the way, there's, there's a number of countries, Argentina right now is experiencing inflation. 
there's a number of countries around the world that do not have an independent central bank. The fiscal policy and the monetary policy are all controlled by the government. And that has proven year after year, time after time, uh, to be bad news for the real people like you guys and your moms and dads, that the government ends up screwing up the economy because they got easy money by being able to run the printing press. So this is a huge feature of why traditionally um, the United States has been pretty successful in avoiding inflation. So let's kind of write some of that. What does it mean for the Fed to be independent? Um, the Fed does not work for the president and is completely autonomous. Which means they can work alone, right? In monetary policy. Now, I used to believe this a little more than I'm teaching you now, because <laughs> I think some things have been changing a little bit on this front, which is a little troubling for me. Okay, so questions or comments on that? So the independence of I guess I, I did want to add that other, uh, let's put it note number two, because when we get into the final chapter, part of economic freedom is going to be kind of this type of issue of having inflation under control and that sort of thing. So uh, note number two, uh, many countries have the president control both monetary and fiscal policy in varying forms. So let's just put our example, Zimbabwe. And then there's a whole host of other examples that have done some bad things. All right, um, I think we are ready for my aha moment, which I'm not even sure how to present to you, because this is all new. I, wanna, I think you guys have the basic information. Um, you know, before I put something on the board, I think I'm there, I'm gonna write some things out. So let's say, um, let's kind of break this into two parts here. Um, prior, let's do pre-financial crisis, pre-2008 financial crisis, and then post. So pre-financial crisis, we had the required reserve ratio was approximately 10% for everybody, 10% for all banks and there was no interest on reserves and what we observed was that pretty much banks in order to make money they loaned out all their money so for the most part banks loaned out all excess reserves, approximately all excess reserves to, let's say, real world people. <laughs> what do I mean by that? Um, entrepreneurs, uh, real estate developers, that was me back in the day. Uh, small business owners, and 
consumers, right? Consumers for houses and cars primarily. And so in effect, the decision making for financial loans was very decentralized. So kind of put the, let's put a key point on here. <clears throat> you know, local knowledge of borrowers and lenders was maximized. You know, throughout all the United States, so to speak. So, you know, Russ McCullough has some sort of whiz-bang idea to redevelop a property in downtown Des Moines, Iowa along with his business partners, and they go ask for a $5 million loan. By the way, this is a true story. So we go out and get a $5 million loan. The banker's like, Russ, are you crazy? And then I try to persuade them, and they're like, oh, well, this starts to make sense. Yeah, this, this area is doing. So the bank has a responsibility to kind of double check McCullough's ideas for developing this property. McCullough, of course, doesn't want to lose his money or the, uh, his investor's money, so he's been trying to be pretty careful about putting this deal together, right? So we're kind of harnessing local knowledge about this $5 million loan. Well, that's what went on pre-financial crisis. Okay, so then post-financial crisis, post-2008, We have interest on reserves. Interest on reserves causes banks to not loan out all excess reserves and keep more money on deposit with the Fed and keep more money on deposit with the Fed. So the other thing that we observed is that the Fed started buying more and more types of assets. So Fed buys, let's call it non-government bonds, like mortgage-backed securities. For our purposes, mortgage-backed securities is like a bundle of private home loans. So bundles of home mortgages, to keep it as simple as possible. Um, one of the things that evolved in the financial sector was to, oh, we know some people are gonna default on their loan, but if we put a thousand of them together and we sell it for $10 million, then this will be something the Wall Street people can you know, buy and sell and trade, mortgage-backed securities. So they get involved in that market and we also see a huge rise in government bonds as well. Fed buys lots more government bonds because of bailouts from the crisis and now COVID. and COVID fiscal policy. We mentioned the $1,500 payments that went out to everybody, right? All right, so my aha moment is that we have just 
did a fairly major shift of putting power and decision making in Washington, D.C. with Biden and Jerome Powell and the central bank because we used to put that money into the local knowledge here where the banks were doing the lending and now that's shifted a bit to the Fed doing more and more of that. I got about at least five to ten minutes more to say, but we're going to do that on Thursday. But there's the foundation for the aha moment.